Hello, I'm Rob Hirschfeld, CEO and co-founder of RackN, and this is the January 21st Cloud 2030 discussion where we went deep into OpEx and CapEx and how the thinking around OpEx spending changes the innovation cycles around what we build. This is fundamentally disruptive and an amazing conversation that should help you see cloud in a totally different way. I know it did for me. Enjoy the discussion. So we've been, we, we, we have a tendency to be, you know, very, um, you know, we're, we're talking about the future. So sort of hand wavy. And one of my goals have, has always been that we can start writing something down and, and getting some predictions and some of the feedback I was getting yesterday, we, we got, we talked about a specific inflection point last, last, last week. I was hoping we would spend some time like actually writing it down and documenting what, what that would, what that would look like. And I was going to share my screen instead of counting on shared notes so that we, we get focused around that. Let me do that. Uh, this one, which is going to make it harder for me to see people, but, uh, and so, so I was, I was hoping to, and, I, and I'm, I'm going to step in a little bit more to try and focus it, focus us in on this, on this inflection point. Um, and from last week, the conversation that really sort of felt like it jibed to me is that we were talking about an inflection point of when user, when control switches more back to users' hands. Do people remember that? Mm -hmm. So we were, what we were talking about is when there is um, I, I'm trying to remember exactly what the trigger was for that for that inflection point. Um, I think it was John um, that was talking, laid it out, laid it out really clearly. I could pull up a transcript, but um, you know what? Do, does anybody remember specifically, like, or can reencapsulate what was triggering an inflection point for? Hyperscaler control shifting back into user more into user hands. Otherwise, actually, I'll, I'm going to pull up my notes so I can. Yeah, no, unfortunately. So, I mean, I mean, I wasn't on the call last week, but so I mean, I'll, I'll give my opinion about it really quickly, Please? right? It, I mean, I mean, if you look at sort of the legislative landscape, you know, the whole, um, the whole right to, you know, the European privacy law, the the one in California, I mean, that's all, you know, you know, there's, I mean, I think there's certainly by 2030, there's going to be a regulatory landscape where, you know, if rational people are in charge, um, you know, people, individuals, individuals are going to have some control over their digital identity, right, from a legal point of view. And I think, uh, I think those companies will have to respect that. Yeah, it's interesting. That wasn't that wasn't quite where we were going. the 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 thing The thing that we were talking about is that technology is is getting to a point where everybody's figured out cloud, right? That the infrastructure. Oh, this was actually so. Here's here's where we go. Right now, cloud cloud lock in is part of. Um, maybe lock-in is, is too strong a word for some people, but, but cloud um, uh, walled gardens are a key part of, of the accelerative effect of the innovation, right? So the fact that you're doing everything on Amazon is a factor of we don't, we're still figuring out what we're doing. There aren't a lot of patterns. It's not repeatable. But part of a normal innovation cycle says, and this is, I guess, one of the first questions, right? Um, you know, does does the innovation cycle start breaking down the wall garden and moving power back into the 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 user's hands? Um, virtualization did that like six or seven years ago, and it, we're like, yeah, VMware is great, but you know, it's not really differentiated anymore. I can get virtualization other places. You know, hardware, chips, things like that. We're moving into a place where the, the cycle says, we know how to do this. We don't need your guardrails on how to, how to do it. And it becomes a marketplace again. 
we have to be more specific. We have to, well, to think about. I, I've got, I've got an idea for that, Barnes. So um, one of the big differences uh, from about a decade or probably longer ago than that, maybe go back 15, 20 years, is there was a lot of systems integrators, so-called various forms of that. But essentially what they did is they, they uh, worked on um, removing the complexity for customers and they implemented technology for them. You know, they, they bought the routers and switches and IP phones and mm -hmm. did all that stuff. And the end result for their customers was they had some cool technology that was relatively state of the art and did interesting stuff. Um, over the last decade, uh, even though there's been a lot more um, small business oriented um, technology that's come available like with AWS, but unfortunately, this is some integrators for to a large extent haven't kept up. So uh, we've started uh, kind of uh, gone back into a cycle where a lot of the intelligence for how to build this stuff has moved inside to the companies and we've lost a lot of um, flexibility to be able to move stuff around to different vendors um, because that there's just not as many people that, I mean, there's certainly some and there's some good ones but there's just not as many as there was in my estimation, uh, my visibility to what there was like 20 years ago. Um, so the technology is getting closer and I think the skill sets are getting closer to where that's possible with stuff like Easto and, and uh, Knative um, that are providing standards for being able to support multiple cloud vendors and be able to move stuff around. Um, so I, I think we're getting closer to being able to support that again, but it's, uh, I think we're like with a lot of things, I think if we just went through a cycle where um, a few companies started to dominate because um, there wasn't the skills available to uh, make that uh, less of a necessity. If that makes sense. I, and let me add, go ahead, Lawrence, go ahead. Think about an inflection point. I want to see there to be significant revenue coming into companies besides the major cloud companies before, so that could pay for engineers that will gen, that'll be generating the innovation to coming from other companies besides the big cloud companies. AWS, cloud, Google, et cetera, are generating innovation partially just because they pay for some of the best and the most engineers. And, and what I was going to add, and what I was going to add real quick, and, and I think this is the conversation we had a week ago as well, based, basically adding on to what Sean was saying, is that was this around the conversation of how much time do we invest going forward with like applications being deployed on AWS and all the clouds and consuming those services of 9 million services that AWS provides versus now let's start going back and saying some of these services let's manage ourselves kind of to what lawrence was saying let's invest that that time and effort into engineers that are not aws certified engineers architects and things like that to be able to manage those applications for our business so we could get portable again was yep. that the that, that was the other part of that conversation i think wasn't it yeah, we don't have um, a, a, a rather simple engineering way of saying is um, the skill set of continuous integration and continuous deployment is yep. not something you generally see on resumes. And until we have that, um, you know, these workloads that are stuck um, on vendors um, are going to remain stuck because, yep. I mean, it, another way of putting it is SolarWinds hack was bad but it should be relatively easy if you know how to build and burn your, your infrastructure and scan it for the solar winds hack, you should be able to rebuild your infrastructure in a matter of minutes. But the reason why it's such a huge deal for most of these government orgs is they're a decade at least behind on technology. They, they're still building VMs. Yep. You know, and they think they're, they're state of the art because they have so, you know, 30 people building a VM that then they have to curate and, and maintain where the, the, standard today is, you know, build it and burn it. You know, yep. it's, it's a, it's a cow, not a pet or exactly. a cattle, not a pet. 
Yeah. We were kind of talking about that uh, on hmm. Tuesday, how, how uh, like 10 years ago, we would uh, be creating golden images. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we switched to base images plus uh, whatever we wanted to install on top of that with configuration management. And then we went back to essentially golden images with containers. Yep. That's exactly right. And you know, the interesting thing to just to add a little bit of additional color to this, and we don't have to go down this rabbit hole, but I, I want to just kind of huh. highlight something that uh, did he say? Oh, I don't want to go down a rabbit hole. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of, of where we're going because I'm, <laughs> you I'm know trying me. to, I'm trying to start with your rabbit hole. But what we're, what we're starting to talk about is skill sets. Continue well, skill set, but no portability. So what? Yes. But what we're, what we're describing is maybe I, I don't care about how we get there. But if, if in, in five years, and let, let's do it this way, if in five years we actually have workload portability. Right. And maybe that's because what I'm trying to do is I want to frame it so that we, we actually talk through and get to, all right, if we need that, if, if that happens and those are good consequences, then how do we get to workload portability? And that might be a whole nother conversation. But yeah. I, I mean, five, add, five is, years, it'd be thread workload, Excuse me. Is workload or is workload portability the best indicator of an open ecosystem? And I'd argue that good that question. might not that might be pretty restrictive. Let's I mean, why why is well, you tell me, why uh, is workload portability the kind of harbinger or the you know the the acid test of of an open ecosystem? That's a good point. I, I, I don't know that it is rich or the only one. And I I'm happy to entertain that as as a like ask that question i what i'm what i'm driving to and i'm a little cart before horse maybe but i'm trying to drive us to um lay out sort of you know this this scenario the scenario grid of of that but if you know maybe we just pick one thing like portability to make that or maybe we need to have a conversation of first of what what creates the open ecosystem um so let's why don't we do that why don't we spend a couple minutes saying what aspects of an open ecosystem are that what makes something an open ecosystem would that be a good starting point and then well, I, wanted hey, to actually, I think that's a good that's a good place yeah to well okay. and along those lines back to what sean said with the value-added integrators yep. uh what i've been seeing amongst some of the younger folk is they'll go off and they'll work at google uh, be a solutions architect for a bit and go off and work at Amazon, be a solutions architect. And then they'll go off and start their own little small company and build for small enterprise, not large enterprise. Mm -hmm. And I think what we will see as the skill sets improve is these folks will understand multiple different walled gardens and then implement the commonalities as commonalities. So there'll be a base set that goes across multiple clouds and then value added and decisions made as to which cloud to move to based on the differentiators across the clouds. But the yeah. base set will become important and bring in the education and the information for everybody. Yeah, and Rocky, you actually went to the, the rabbit hole that I was gonna take us to. Um, as a <laughs> is that what I what I've seen and I want to leave it at this because I want to build on that and then I want to get back to what Rob was where he was going with this is what I've seen so so one of the things I've been doing over the last week or so is I've been exploring kind of job descriptions and uh, opportunities out there and kind of getting a sense of what they're looking for from different kind of different um, different angles even director positions engineering positions architect positions and things like that and, and Rob, you may have seen, I put this on Twitter the other day. And what I'm trying to do is have the conversation is what I, I came across a, a one the other day that was, I'm not big on titles um, because you either earn it or you don't, right? You either know what you're doing or you don't, in my opinion, versus a title. I don't need a title to actually justify or assert. But I came across something interesting the other day. And what, what made me think of it is what Sean was saying is a lack of CICD experience. Um, I saw a position the other day that was for a senior systems engineer. 
I've been that title before. I'm sure many of us have. They're looking for somebody that knows Kubernetes. They know the CICD, all these different things that are not senior systems engineer things. My question is, are we starting to see either A, we know how job descriptions are generally very much BS, um, but are we actually seeing where they're trying to bring these skills back in house where they're saying we're looking for this unicorn to come in and do a thing because we want to start exploring this. So I'm gonna end there because I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole now, but I wanted to throw it out because of what Sean said and now what Rocky said, I came back to that. So I'm pausing. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the, the VAR thing. It's also, I think digitalization is driving some of it where mm -hmm. people's digitalization fails because they don't have that expertise to say, this is what will get us to where we're going. and. Yep. So we're back to the VAR thing where let's pay for the expertise to set us up with something that works. Yep. So, so I'm sort of in a bit of the thick of this, right? We are, I mean, I work for one of the big systems integrator um, and we have a very healthy cloud practice. It is successful. It's very successful at dealing with small and mid-sized enterprises um, not and not very successful in dealing with large enterprises because for the reasons that people are bringing up here is you know they want to do that kind of work on their own where we are seeing um, traction is in um, the skills transfer business where a large enterprise will, you know, will use us as a augment to their staff or to their expertise for either a particular project or add to a particular team that's falling behind. Um, I'm not sure how that plays into sort of strategy overall, um, but I don't. I I don't think people are using. I don't think enterprises are viewing technology, any, whether it's cloud or not, any different than they did before cloud, right? <clears throat> they either do yeah. it themselves or they hire some, they either do it themselves and learn how to do it, or they farm it out to somebody else. Yep. Yeah, and I actually, Don, that's actually a really good point because I actually had a conversation with a potential partner that we were we were looking at partnering with from a business perspective. And they made that exact comment like you did from an enterprise because we were like, here's what we can offer from a service per perspective. And they were like, yeah, we really deal with, you know, Fortune 500s or 50s, whatever they were, you know, the bigger enterprises and that. And they're either A, they're not doing it or B, they feel like they're competent enough to actually do it. And then you go look at some of these jobs and they're with big enterprises and they're trying to align these skills with these positions. And you're like, yeah, you're still doing it wrong. You know what I mean? It's it's interesting. At least that's my perception, and that's probably completely wrong. So, well, I, I think the uh, you know you know the big enterprises have who, who have always been dependent upon technology have always had their own technical people. Yep. Um, they can't, you can't seed something that is critical mm -hmm. to your business to, you know, a third party, right? If you're a, um, uh, you know, if you're, uh, if you're a, you know, if you're, if your business runs on technology, you have to have people that are on your payroll that are responsible yeah. to that enterprise, right? Who are responsible for that technology. Yep. And if you're, I mom and pop shop you know a mom and pop shop who just needs the damn thing to work right you know i'll out you know i'll outsource it it's an interesting thing because this is this is part of where we are today which is that the technology is so hard to consume that that you're there it's very much i you know giving people have been seeding the control of it um, well, that's, right. Operating within the operating within the vendor within the vendor's boundaries. Well, um, 
I, I'd add a little bit. I, I'd say yeah. DevOps is hard. And um, for especially CFOs, a lot of companies, they don't really understand it. You know, CTOs obviously have a lot of power or whoever holds that role. But CFOs always are the ones that really have the power, right? <laughs> that's, where, you, that's where it I'm, lies. And if I'm, they don't I need say... To, I need to drop. I'm meeting with my boss. So I, but this is, this is I, I hate to throw a grenade and run away, but this is really awesome. Thank you. Cool. Cheers. Thanks for enjoying it. So, yeah. so um, in, in most companies that I've been at, large and small, the people who hold the purse strings uh, will not pay, uh, for lack of a better word, for the disruption that hiring and retooling the, the, the environment, that bringing on true DevOps skills and the, the type of uh, infrastructure and uh, dynamic workload uh, support that is necessary. They, they just won't, they don't understand it. They won't pay for it. Um, yep. Now, I, I think we're getting closer to it. I think we need to have system integrators that can say, oh, here's X and it can go all over the place. We're going to build you X and maybe X like uh, represents like Slack in a bottle. Um, and they go, a, I can now make Slack for you be completely transparent to the infrastructure it's running on, whether it's running on yours or AWS or Rackspace. And now you can move it all over the place and we can upgrade it on the fly and you can move it all over the, up the place and bring it down, scan it, do whatever you want. We're just, um, there are very few organizations that think that way. Um, and until we get closer to that kind of portability, we're, that's uh, that makes that possible because you'd have to think through a daily management. You think have to think through a whole bunch of things yeah. um, that's, it's just not, it's too difficult to, to orchestrate um, internally and most system integrators won't want to touch it because um, it's complicated and, yeah. you know, customers don't want to pay for it. So they, they to that, go back to supporting one vendor. Yeah. And to that point, Sean, within that was where I was going with that you know, taking a job title where to us, or at least to me, it doesn't matter, but where it does matter is when you start talking pay scale, right? Yeah. If you're looking at it from, yeah. from the perspective, I'm bringing in a senior system engineer and I want all these DevOps skills and I'm looking at them like, yeah, I could walk in today and get you going. But the reality is you're not going to be willing to pay me for those skills that justify that, that, that work to actually get in place um, because you're going to be the go-to person, right? Yeah, but but hold but hold on, because because what what we're this is this to me is where the inflection point starts getting interesting, yep. because you're describing bespoke building, and part of the problem with with where we are right now, and, and the reason why you know the, the the vendors in the status quo scenario I have here in the unchecked growth, what what's happening is that we are, you know, every you know either you're doing custom stuff. Or you are not doing it. You're dealt. You're you're giving it up as a SaaS, yes. right? Part of what Sean was describing is, hey, we should make it to a point where this doesn't require that much skills. Um, so, or I don't we, think you know, that's, no, it's go ahead. I'm gonna I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna push back, please. First of all, give me an example, historical example of an open ecosystem in kind of our, our domain. And if I look back at it, it's mostly about, you know, the qualities of exposed surfaces, the interfaces, if you want to think about it, or interconnectivity, what's available. And it's usually characterized or the metrics of an open ecosystem are kind of a democratization it's, it's, in, it's kind of leaning towards self-serve. It's almost always readily documented or self-documented. And there's some sort of rationality in the management that does not lead to an explosion or a replication of things kind of that clutters up, clutters up the world. So if I were thinking about it in our environment right now, hmm. it would be APIs as, you know, kind of 
using the state of APIs as kind of an index or a metric by which I'd say, yeah, we've hit the inflection point or we've hit whatever you're talking about as being an open, you know, we, we've crossed over a boundary into an open ecosystem. And that would mean that, you know, APIs in general would have to be discoverable. They'd have to be uh, multi-perspective. They'd really have to be productized. They're not just exposed surfaces. They really are products. They're thought of as products. They are built for and mm -hmm. with the end user in mind. And it's not so much a portability as it is an, a connectability or an interworking or interconnection. And if I were mm -hmm. basically saying, at what point will I know we've hit the, the inflection point in cloud? It's going to be on the back of kind of observing the state of APIs and how they are, how they are generated, how they are consumed, and uh, the degree to which they are productized. I think that yeah, there's two they inflection have to be points. Blocks. Was that so? Oh, sorry, hi, oh, it's Joanne. Go for it. Um, no, I just wanted to say two things. Listening to this discussion, one on the CFO side. Uh, where I find that there is an inflection point is if you can make the argument for OPEX versus CAPEX, you're ahead of the game. And that's the way you lead that discussion, or it's been my experience that that works very well, because I can now say, mm -hmm. okay, you have sunk cost in legacy systems, you can avail yourself to Rich's point of APIs to microservices that allow you to make part of that reusable and you can decrease your capex on an annual basis moving it to opex which is far easier to get and far more disposable because you're not looking at board level i need to get you know uh, 25 million dollars to be able to build this across six organizations or six operating companies whatever uh, instead you can apportion it and even charge it back as opex to either suppliers or customers, at least in the manufacturing side uh, or the distribution side. And by lowering the CapEx, depending on what country it is, of course, there's different rules for, for tax and depreciation. But for the most part, they're buying into that argument big time that now you're going to have a much more reasonable, assignable way of saying, I need you know, $10,000 a month, almost the way you would do SaaS but not for SaaS necessarily, and you have reusability and you're removing some of the technical debt and the sunk cost associated with CapEx. Joanne, Those are the inflection points. Joanne, maybe Tim, mm. do you think that uh, like is, we're still at a point where more than two thirds of companies haven't gotten to the point where they're not comfortable using OpEx instead of CapEx for IT spending? I think um, I, I'd like to answer your question very specifically, if I may. This is very situationally dependent because it really depends on where IT's budget comes from. In countries outside the US, with all due respect, um, there's much more of a um, spend based on other like departments that are paying for IT. IT has no budget. It's funded through global operating companies and or global uh, business units. And so therefore those contributions are um, flexible on an annual basis. So for that reason, I would say perhaps I have more success in this area only because of the fact that those companies are pri primarily Canada, US, some in the US, but very large enterprise and in the EU. So they look at IT budgeting very differently because the rules of engagement in terms of how taxes are calculated or how depreciation is calculated on computing are different. You also have the issue of, just hang on one sec, let me finish my last bit of thought, is that even software 
is calculated in a different way. And so because of that, the overall OPEX argument is far easier to make. I know CIOs and CTOs that have little slush funds, and they're not so little actually, that they can throw that as OPEX expense and never even have to justify it. You get over the whole, give me an ROI case, give me the business case, give me the CFO, beg, plead, you know, cajole, whatever, um, issues far easy, far more easily because you can just go to a, a, a senior VP at a global business unit that funds IT and say, look, I need X amount of dollars and this is what it's going to buy you in value, whether it's there's, faster there's time another, to market or customer value. Yeah, there's another countervailing force here that uh, most of us don't end up playing in often. And that is the fact that if you are a publicly traded company, mm -hmm. CapEx is actually used in the stock market as an indicator of corporate health. It is how, you know, when you look at the absolute level of capital expenditure for a publicly traded company, yeah, that is often used as an index of this is a healthy company, it's investing in itself. Oh. When you put the, the, there are all sorts of good reasons to move, you know, from CapEx to OpEx. We know them as, uh, the CIO knows them, the development community knows them. Great. Turns out that the financial markets do not. And in publicly traded oh. companies, CapEx is still one of those, um, one of those metrics yes. that it's used and it skews that decision that Lawrence was just asking about. There's different tricks to uh, moving what's normally CapEx like labor, for instance, and uh, capitalizing it, which I think is just BS, paperwork, <laughs> shuffling things around. Right. But, um, but back to the earlier point, I, I think there's to a certain extent as more uh, of the financial side of the, especially larger businesses caught on to, there's this easy way to spend more uh, OPEX and reduce our CAPEX or at least manage it in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, it opened a safety valve of sorts and the rush to AWS and not so much Google, but AWS and, and uh, Azure, Microsoft. And um, it didn't really solve as many problems that just created a new problem that and now it's, there's less of a strategy at the companies I've been at. They just uh, now the individual departments are determining their strategy and they suck at it. <laughs> so Y'all are, are, are saying something that is, that is, that is head scratching to me. I, although I, I acknowledge it's truth, right? So what you're saying is there's an externality to the technical decisions, which is yeah. fine, right? About, about the way people want to spend investment money towards op OPEX, which is an accelerate, accelerant in all of these pieces. Um, right? Well, it's a sugar so, high. Well, well, it's a, well, it's a, it's a sugar quick. high, but, but from that perspective, I mean, it's, it, there's nothing about Amazon. You could turn a server into an OPEX expense. Dell, Dell's doing exactly that. HP is doing exactly that. They can make those OPEX expenses. I don't see the, turning into can't do the reverse. That's they, they or they argue about how to do the reverse. It's hard to capitalize software, for example. They're, right. they're having once gone to having once gone to uh, cloud services and do and basically consumable. Um, you don't yeah. you don't um, you don't capitalize your the consumption of electricity in your manufacturing plant. You do capitalize it if you build your own power station, power generator. Right, yeah, which, which on a price per well, watt ends up saving you money, but people who don't care about that, right? So, so part, of, part of what's behind this is what we're saying is in, in a 10 year cycle, we do not expect businesses to start caring about capital return on investments for, for IT infrastructure, right? They, they are gonna be content to continue to to do it as an OPEX expense where they are paying by the, the unit of work, 
rather than owning the infrastructure. Well, I think it, what it, it may end up is a, is a new form of it. I'll call it a new form of economics or some new economic rules of the road. And that will be used both in things like a cloud and, and computing the way we now are going about it. And it will also be used in the, in the new economics of data, one of my soapboxes. But, but if uh, that happens in 10 years, or if we're starting to see it in 10 years, you'll start seeing a more, I won't call it rational, but it will be a more predictable approach to what you're, what you're discussing right now. But, all right, but I, I wanna make a big leap out of this. But Rob, Sorry? Rob, I think, you, I think you have to, to look at this as, I, I might take is this is aspirational. I think in the 10 year horizon, that's uh -huh. not a, it's not a reality um, because it, it's gonna come back to which is gonna be more valuable to the organization and tangibly valuable. Mm -hmm. If that comes via a capital expense or operational expense, I really don't think it'll matter in a 10 year horizon. Mm -hmm. Different companies will have different preferences as to where they wish to, to uh, spend based on their budgeting and their, their particular financial structure and status. But mm -hmm. I think in the 10 year horizon for IT specifically, it's gonna come back to where does the value come from? Does it come from a capital investment and you know from experience i'd say rich that i to a large degree was capitalizing software but not consumables not consumable software exactly and and but the it used to be the case that you could not capitalize software and, what do you have seen but, but hold, is the move is the move towards capitalizing and one of the and things I, that we are hold, also hold on when, hold on a, when hold on a second can, though can write off <laughs> the opex of the cloud that actually drives it it's it's what when, the SEC I'm, I'm sorry, allows Rocky, for they, capital cap companies to do so uh, would you repeat and that's always really lagging first but, companies make a profit off of doing it a different way with the cloud way and once it becomes too profitable and and such things the balance off a bit then the sec steps in to make the rules <laughs> Yeah, in okay. the U.S., it's certainly in the U.S. that happens. Um, one of the but, things that we're talking about is how do you, how does a company, whether it's publicly public or not, how does it monetize what is usually thought of as opex? In other words, how do you, how do you turn that into, how do you turn that into money? And a lot of it is. Top line, I'm I'm improving, you know, the revenue. Some of it is bottom line, or I'm sorry, top line and bottom line. I can either make more money or be more efficient in my spend, or I can turn something that I'm that I have been using as solely for internal consumption into a product that I sell or trade outside of my business. These are hard things for economists to deal with. It's certainly difficult for today's CFOs, whether we're talking about publicly traded or private, uh, not, not public organizations. And these are, these do impact the, the speed with which, you know, these indicators show up in our, in our markets. And but but are, Rich, does knowledge. this, but Rich, does this actually impact a company's use of cloud, you know, kind of bringing this full circle back to cloud. I've never run across a situation where the CapEx OpEx conversation has impacted a company's ability to leverage cloud or how they've leveraged cloud versus well, I certainly on -prem. have. I have, particularly when it's a hybrid, particularly when it's multiple, you know, a conglomerate with yeah, different business true. Types. True. Uh, yeah, I have seen banks, that. Uh, mm -hmm. Banks that have financial services. I had actually a discussion yesterday with your DOD folk and um, uh, <laughs> the uh, manufacturing institutes that are created all over the country. And right. we had a very similar discussion and we were discussing the areas where they would have to have private cloud versus public cloud use 
how they could write, how they could deal with the monetary side of it. And most assuredly, it's a driver. And the calculations that um, part of my discussion with them and the reason for the call was, you know, technology value management framework in, in the calculations that I originally made, things like time to decision, time to value, all of those can be easily quantified. So although it goes somewhat contrary to counterintuitive, I should say, these are the kinds of things that many companies are starting to adopt, whether they are public, private, uh, public private partnerships, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, and no, to, your I, point, to your point, Joanne, public sector expenditure, whether it's you know, federal, military, regional, state, um, they're the externalities that are caused by the way and the means by which they buy budget and are held accountable absolutely right. do impact these these decisions. Right. Yes, yeah. I can. I completely agree with both of you. I completely misstated the point I was trying to make. Um, I completely agree with you. I was trying okay. to make a completely different point. I just, want to, see, I just want to see how fast you can backpedal, Crawford. <laughs> Go ahead, Lawrence. <laughs> can I ask um, Joanne a question real quick? Yeah, sure. OK, thanks. Um, so <laughs> in your experience, um, your recent experience, was it the cost um, was the need to um, uh, amortize the capital costs over a long period of building a full stack, essentially data center to SaaS, that was um, giving them heartache, or is it only one part of the stack? It was okay. So um, I come from a world of very large enterprise. Those are some of our clients still today. Um, so, for example. Um, what gives them grief is the fact that when a company is acquiring another and you get into the business systems integration side, they're acquiring data centers that already exist, some of sure. which are not, not as legacy as you might think that they are. So, but it's those differences. And, and that's the, how do I now pardon the expression, lift and shift to public cloud for a majority, and then keep that which I must keep private as private cloud or data center or some mishmash of, of it. That's where they start getting into difficulty. And that's what gives them the most grief. Because if you look at the way digital transformation is being priced, it includes not only the FTEs and, and the different titles of engineering, and et cetera, that come into it, but they really must go back to their enterprise digital architecture and start from there. So what they're trying to do is find the most opportunistic way to pull the digital thread, whether it's in discrete or process manufacturing, upstream or downstream from that model, uh, somehow or another that stack has to be redeveloped and how they apportion those costs, both upstream and downstream, is what, where they're trying to get to. So in other words, if I want to truly be a digital business, that means I'm outcome driven and I'm reverse engineering my digital architecture from the points of the outcome backwards. Okay, so you reverse have engineering model. So you have and to competitive answer the question specifically, that's where they get into trouble with the existing data stacks, or, or rather I should say, machinery so the integration of competitive workloads how to how to capitalize or um how to capitalize that or well part of it, another part way of, of it is, summarizing what you're saying yeah part of it is capitalization but part of it is also that you can't take very large investments in software take sap for example they're now sure. moving to a cloud model holy bleep it is not only extremely difficult, but they've spent years, and I mean 100 person man years in setting these systems up to run efficiently on floors in manufacturers, whether it's, you know, um, Glaxo Welcome or Ford, it doesn't matter. They have all that stunt cost and now to go back and retool to meet SAP's version of cloud, no. 
they get into a lot of difficulty. Isn't that more of a data gravity problem rather than an, a uh, workload problem? You know, where the, da the data actually lives? No, it's not. No? It, okay. Because many of, um, many of the lines, like for example, I'm working on something now with, with re respect to COVID, which I would touch on if Rob gives me the two minutes to talk mm -hmm. about. But irrespective of that, um, there's, it's not where, it's not so much where the data lives because these are international companies. It's much more about, or the workload of it. It's much more about, can I produce a good at the end of a run? Period, full stop. How much time is it going to take me? Where can I optimize that time to value? And time to decision is a big part of it. So balancing the workload is not the issue. It's how can I do this as efficiently and quickly as possible because my workload is going to vary from factory to factory, line to line, job to job. Okay. Sorry yeah, I was just, that was a long answer. No, no, it's all right. I was just pointing out that, it, um, I mean, a, a very rough way of summarizing moving database services from uh, from locally, which is you know on the factory floor, to somewhere else, um, a cloud model. Um, I was just assuming that uh, the movement of the data, which is uh, requires a whole lot of absorption of latency um, to the factory floor, is is going to be an issue. Um, the, cost, but, the, cost of, the cost of doing it and the costs of doing it successfully, for example, with smart replication. You know, yeah, splitting things and, up. It's it's a factor, Sean, but yeah. it's absolutely not the drive. It's not the longest pole in the tent. It's essentially and it's, localization. But but there's but there's a whole different problem to me that that I wanted to come back to, which is in in this opex model where we're 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 you know that if that's the framework that we're innovating around, then. There is there we are not making the type of cap you know what, what you're saying is we're not we're not going to see a business driver in mainstream towards a capital investment model we're gonna we're gonna continue to see innovation as a you know done in on top of an opex model in small bites and 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 if that's really the case then the way that we've been innovating where you're building on top of a, of a walled garden innovation, right? That's how you're, you're looking at the innovation model, not as building capital, which is what our innovation models have been. What I'm hearing is that we're no, building an I innovation think, model yeah, that is an opex focused you, innovation. You need to think about innovation slightly differently, Rob. And I agree. I understand what you're saying, but- that's what I'm trying to opex, tease out. Opex is ephemeral. It's something that's consumed. Once uh -huh. done, it's done, it's gone. CapEx lives on. CapEx, you know, mm -hmm. has has value over time. I can talk about its net present value. It CapEx is okay, it there's a gravity, there's a gravitational pull of CapEx that right. keeps you from innovating. And yes, if you can get to OpEx, that's the place where you're a little bit more at ease in innovating. But it doesn't I, the, but, every company uh, is going to have it. it. That's, that's weird. On top of it is the, uh, the uh, large CapEx and OpEx, right? Go ahead. So the large multinationals, the folks that, and nationals, the folks that Joanna is, is dealing with, it's a totally different world from what we call enterprise. And Correct. And so because of the nature of, enter, uh, of innovation and whatnot in Silicon Valley, we start from the small and work to the large. And the large folks that jo Joanne is dealing with, they're always trying to figure out how the hell they can actually succeed in using this stuff that wasn't designed from the, for them and making it efficient and effective. And yes. So like the, the SAP, issue is you move everything into one location which is fine for most enterprises it breaks all of the localities with different functionality and different purpose which in 
most enterprises, there'd be one or two large manufacturing assembly uh, locations that were doing pretty much the same thing. They can do this migration backwards. When you've got a hundred different small manu, a hundred different manufacturing, the size of that enterprise that has one or two, and each of them has a totally different process, a totally different endpoint. Life gets to be held trying to make the process work when it, we're where we're at right now. Small, we're still focused too small. And I would say Netflix is an example of how Netflix forced AWS to allow them a different way of interacting with AWS because they were large enough that they could. And so they inflicted on AWS their needs as opposed to vice versa. But right now, most of the cloud companies are saying, this is what you get rather than listening to their the companies that want to use them on a large scale and having those companies say this is what we need yeah i i my, this conversation rocky has made me question something more fundamental than that i would have agreed with you at the beginning of the call and and for next week what i want to explore is this idea if we've changed the innovation cycle altogether with this opex versus capex discussion if the way in which we are going to see innovation go forward is built on the idea that it's an op X that, that, that innovation R and D forward looking change in our infrastructure is going to be based on op X. And if that actually changes the way we look at what we build and how we do it, what, how we innovate and things like that, because this could, this is, if this is the case, then we've already created a, a significant disrupt, disrupt, disruption that is going to have profound imp impacts on, on technology. Rob, um, that's yeah. more than the case. I've talked to lots of economic professors that are focused on, op on open source, and that's the key to their whole entire thesis. So, but I would fundamentally disagree. I think it's I, I think this is all cyclical, cyclical stuff. That um, it, the only the only difference in any of this is that uh, capital spend generally requires strategic thinking and um, more of higher level management to be involved. And usually capital mm -hmm. spend is organized maybe once or twice a year um, with a lot of top-down thinking. And OPEX is more of a spend that departments and smaller uh, entities within the organization have a lot of uh, liberal ideas, or that's probably not the right word, but a lot of flexibility um, in how they spend it. And are given, um, you know, basically carte blanche. You know, take this twenty million, do whatever you want. But this fifty million, you know, you have to spend it exactly this way. And whether they figure out a fancy way of making that be AWS, or, or a fancy way of figuring yeah. out um, how to spend that twenty million on a data center, which you know, for a little fancy accounting, you can do almost anything you want. Um, so I think it's it's less of um, how. Um, how that money is going to be spent, just that different organizations are going to spend it in whatever the hell the way they want. Um, they're going to figure out a way. And if, yeah. well, if it's data centers, I, I, wait, it's going to be us. It's I, going to be it. In, in, for respect for time, we, 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 need, to, we need to wrap up. Um, I actually think the dilemma you're leaving us with is a good, is a good closing thought from that perspective. <laughs> um, and I it looked like you, you were raising your hand, and, and Joanne sounds like her you're trying to yeah, say I, my just too. quick comment. I agree. I with just you. wanted to say one thing very quickly to Sean. I don't disagree with you in principle. The reality tends to be different in my world, but think about this at the core of all of this is data and data is still considered an intangible asset that very it, few. I, I would, I would agree where it is is where it is. <laughs> If, if data is in, in if your data is in Missouri and your company is in New York and you need to somehow get access to it, it's a real problem, and it, it can't just be waved away. It has That's to, right. you know, it has to get there somehow, or you have to um, either physically go there or you know digitally go there to get access to it. And if I, your I'm factory is in Missouri, that's where it is. You know, it's the same kind of thing. <laughs> All right, it, it, we... it, it, that's not that's not what I meant. But oh, the rules are about to change. So I think you'll see a lot being different going forward. Anyway, okay. 
that's a, that is also a nice teaser. I, this is amazing. Y'all are make, like making my head explode and questioning core assumptions I have, which I love. Um, thank you. Hopefully I'll see y'all next week. Um, appreciate the time, everybody. And this I was really rousing. Joanne, thank you. You really took us in a really, really interesting direction. Yeah. My I pleasure. appreciate that. Talk hey, Sean, it's soon. good to see you, man. It's been a long good time. To see you too, <laughs> Cheers, y'all. Thanks. Thanks for Cheers. that, Joanne. I'm done for the day. <laughs> oh no! I'm gonna go, go sell all my sell all my worldly possessions and start exactly. shredding my clothes. Exactly. I'm done. Work with <laughs> oh, that was awesome. Thank you. I right, see you guys. Wow, that was a great conversation, and it shows up over and over again in the summit that we had, but also in ongoing conversations. Because when you think about infrastructure as a incremental spend instead of an investment uh, you're thinking about everything else we do changes and we keep discussing that it's important come join us at the 2030.cloud for more of these in-depth conversations we want to hear from you